end of the Civil War was near when quite accidentally A hero who sneezed abruptly seized retreat and reversed it to victory His medal of honor pleased and thrilled his proud little family group While pinning it on some blood was spilled and so it was planned he'd command Neff Troop where Indian fights are colorful sights and nobody takes a lickin'. Where pale face and red skin both turn chicken. When drilling and fighting get them down, they know their morale can't droop. As long as they all relax in town before they resume with a bang and a boom. F Troop! This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon! Hi-ho, Silver! We've reached the third and final Nick at Night crossover show for 1991. You know, those times when Nickelodeon would air some old baby boomer television for its young audience in the daytime hours. They did it quite a few times already, and they'll do it a few times more after this. And while not every one of these shows have been a good fit for the channel, you can at least parse the logic as to why Nickelodeon aired them. Dennis the Menace was a relevant IP, a regular feature in newspaper comics, and there was a new animated series the same time Nickelodeon was airing the older sitcom. Superman was a relevant IP. He was still selling comic books and headlining television shows. Lancelot Link, Secret Chimp was a proper children's show. It was made for one of Nickelodeon's target demographics. The Patty Duke Show was a proper show for teenagers. It was made for one of Nickelodeon's target demographics. The Donna Reed Show aired to cross-promote Nick at Night. Camp Runamuck aired to cross-promote Viacom's Ha! Channel. The Monkees aired to cross-promote the band's big comeback tour and album. Lassie was a fun animal show. Everyone loves a fun animal show. Flipper was a fun animal show. Everyone loves a fun animal show. Mork and Mindy still had relevant star power with Robin Williams. So yeah, you can see why Nickelodeon made the decisions they made. But, um... Guys and gals and non-binary pals, I do not understand why Nickelodeon aired this show. It's not a relevant IP. It's not made for Nick's target demographic. It's not cross-promoting anything. It's not a fun animal show. And it doesn't have star power. Unless kids in 1991 were really into the late Forrest Tucker and I just didn't notice. Maybe we can figure it out together. Premiering on both Nick at Night and Nickelodeon on October 5th, 1991... This is F Troop. When Saturday morning cartoons leave you flat, Nickelodeon's got a whole new dimension. It's the power of four. Superman, F Troop, Dennis the Menace, Flipper. Nickelodeon cuts through the Saturday morning cartoon clutter with the power of four. Four heroes in four hours that will take you wall busting, trail blazing, suds busting, depth charging. So team up with the power of four. This Saturday and every Saturday starting at 10, 9 central on the only network for you, Nickelodeon. It is Balloon! It is F True! It is Nick! On Nick! It's the final months of the American Civil War. Union soldier Wilton Parmiter, played by Ken Berry, comes from a huge family of war heroes. But he's nothing of the sort. Small, clumsy, absent minded, and not terribly bright. Tasked with laundry duty. However, while riding across Union lines, his allergies kick in, and his sneezes are misinterpreted as a call to charge. The Union army charges forth, and actually wins the battle. Parmiter is hailed a war hero, sort of, receiving the Medal of Honor and getting promoted to captain. However, he's still a total boob, so the army decides to transfer him to a place where he can't do any damage. Fort Courage, an insignificant outpost on the western frontier housing a handful of misfit soldiers known as F Troop. There, he can be as clueless and incompetent as he wants without doing any serious damage. Troop! Attention! Present! Arms!
Among those under Captain Parmiter's command are Sergeant O'Rourke, Forrest Tucker, and Corporal Agarn, Larry Storch, two scheming opportunists looking for ways to make some money off of this lousy posting, sucking up to the captain to his face while plotting behind his back. Dobbs, you're first. What'll it be? Blonde, brunette, redhead, tall, short, fat, thin. We aim to please. Well, I like a gal between 21 and 28. 21, 28. Blonde, blue eyes, uh -huh. a real good personality, and a whale of a figure. Ah, fine. We're all out of that model. What are you talking about, Agarn? I bought the last one. You're wrong. I thought employees get preference. <laughs> I'll have one for you and one for him. They'll probably be sisters. One of their biggest business ventures is with the Hekui, a nearby Indian tribe whom O'Rourke has making, quote unquote, Indian souvenirs on a commercial scale to sell to tourists and collectors. The tribe is led by the cranky Chief Wild Eagle, Frank Dakova, and his goofy second-in-command Crazy Cat, Don Diamond. Hey, Crazy Cat! Yes, Chief? Little Fox needs more wood on fire to send the letter. Go chop some. Me chop wood? Well, I'm Assistant Chief. Why you always want me to do the heavy work? Because you're strong like a horse. Not smart like horse, but strong like him. You very hostile Indian. Fort Courage also features a civilian township with homes and a saloon and all that. Here lives Jane Thrift, known to her friends as Wrangler Jane, a young cowgirl who's more competent and a better shot than anybody in F Troop. She quickly takes a liking to Captain Parmiter and tries to woo him but he's as clueless in love as he is in everything else. Wilton Palmer, look at your plate. You ain't hardly touched a thing. Sure I have. You just piled it too high to begin with. I was hoping you'd get so took with my cooking you'd want to eat it the rest of your life. Well, now, that, that's very kind of you, Janie, but what if I got transferred? How would you ship it to me? How would you desert? And so we follow the day-to-day -day lives of these losers on the Western frontier. F-Troop episodes tend to come in two flavors. You have the antics of O'Rourke and Agarn, scrambling to keep their operations running, lying to the captain while doing what they can to keep him around because Parmiter is the only officer dumb enough to sneak one past. So, for example, when an old girlfriend of Parmiter's shows up and tries to get him to marry her, which would see him leave Fort Courage, O'Rourke and Agarn give Wrangler Jane a classy makeover in hopes of seducing the captain. You remember Wrangler Jane? Wrangler? <laughs> Or there's that time a gunslinger wanders into town and threatens to kill the captain. So O'Rourke and Agarn have to come up with elaborate traps to try and cripple the man's shooting hand. Well, go ahead, soldier. Now, these two girls in love with the same salesman, and what? Well, take a drink and it'll be funnier. Oh, don't, don't drink with your left hand. It's bad luck. It is? Yeah. <laughs> The other kind of episode is a weirdo played by a fun guest star wanders into the fort and causes some havoc. Bernard Fox plays a British major who has come to Fort Courage to teach the men his methods of disguise. Shaja Gabor plays the head of a trio of Romani who try to scam Agarn out of his money by convincing him he's a long lost prince. Harvey Corman plays a Prussian balloonist trying to introduce a hot air balloon division into the United States Army. Gentlemen, left troop will attack the Hikavis from the air. And if it works, it is Westford Ho. And tomorrow, the Apaches! <laughs> Produced by Warner Brothers Television, F Troop originally premiered on ABC on September 14th, 1965. F Troop aired during what would be the tail end of the dominance of Westerns on American television. Many of you probably already know that Westerns were very popular in the mid 20th century. But when you actually look at the numbers, it's absurd. The television Western peaked in 1959, which saw over 30 Western shows airing across only three television stations. Seven of that year's top 10 Nielsen rated shows were Westerns. That was the year that Rawhide and Bonanza made their premieres. With that level of oversaturation, it's no surprise that genre fatigue finally started to kick in during the 1960s, especially with the major demographic shift going on as the baby boomers started reaching maturity. As NBC programming chief Larry White put it, the traditional Western fulfilled certain fantasies for people who grew up in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Independence, rugged determination, romance, the pioneer spirit, 
but the form, at least in its traditional, usually simplistic depiction of good guys versus bad guys, is not meaningful in that way to younger people. Audience appetites are more sophisticated. They want a closer approach to reality, whatever the form. The idealistic Western was just not going to cut it in a post-rock and roll, post-civil rights, post-Vietnam War protests world. Western films evolved away from standard John Wayne affairs to revisionist westerns, spaghetti westerns, and acid westerns, showing a grittier, more thematically contemporary side to cowboy stories. F Troop isn't quite as extreme as that, but it is playing with genres in ways that most television westerns weren't, if only because it was the first western sitcom on American television. It was making jokes on the common tropes of the cowboy and Indian story, with the cowboys, if you want to consider them that, either being greedy opportunists or oblivious morons instead of stalwart heroes, and the Indians being cowardly businessmen instead of brave warriors. You got wrong tribe, brother. A cow is not fighters, invent peace pie. A cow is not mad at nobody. Listen, Wild Eagle, either you're gonna fight or you're gonna go back to hunting and fishing. And weave in your own blankets. We fight. <laughs> Which, you know, isn't great. Like, let's not beat around the bush. This show is racist as hell. The Hekui factor into pretty much every episode, so every episode has got wall-to-wall -wall red face. It's got white actors doing exaggerated Indian voices. Every episode is making a clown show of Native American culture. And they're getting some pretty big names in that red face makeup too, like Don Rickles. I don't want to go in business with Soldier Dog. I don't want to be friends with Soldier. Want to be like Brave Lawyer, Geronimo. Chill, chill, chill. His mother spoiled him rotten. Say the line, Bart. The past was a mistake. Yeah! Oh, but don't worry. If you were a kid in the 60s and really wanted to see some cowboy and Indian violence, the show also featured a second tribe, the Shugs, who were violent and attacked Fort Courage from time to time. So we still got to see our heroes shoot and kill a few Indians every once in a while. Yeah, Wrangler Jane, you end that man's life. So you get a goofy, racist caricature of pop culture Indian stereotypes and the actual pop culture Indian stereotypes, both in one show. This sucks. F Troop would see a few competitors during its run, Western sitcoms like Pistols and Petticoats and Rango, but F Troop was the most successful of the lot. If only on the technicality that it was the only one of these shows to make it to a second season, and with a switch to color at that. Westerns were steadily dropping off, though, with 1969 seeing no new Western shows added to the network lineups, the first time in decades, with only five older series continuing on in the 1970s. Not that F Troop would have survived long anyway, even if the Western had still been going on strong, because gimmicky sitcoms were also making their way out the door. We've previously discussed the Rural Purge, when the three big networks started removing sitcoms with rural settings and or characters like the Beverly Hillbillies, Petticoat Junction, and Green Acres, and swapping them out for more city-dwelling shows like The Mary Tyler Moore Show, The Bob Newhart Show, and the collected works of the late Norman Lear. Well, that is certainly true, and if F Troop had made it past 1967, it probably would have also been among the show's jettison during the rural purge. The purge was also just part of a larger trend away from gimmick-driven sitcoms that saturated television during the 1960s. Whereas the sitcoms of the 1950s had been predominantly domestic stories, stories about husbands and wives, families getting in all kind of hijinks, sitcoms in the 1960s tended to be weird. This was the era of the Adams Family, the Munsters, Gilligan's Island, My Mother the Car, I Dream of Jeannie, Bewitched, My Favorite Martian. Instead of Donna Reed juggling the duties of being a housewife, you had Julie Newmar playing a sexy robot woman. The 1970s would see a large pivot from these cartoony concepts to programming grounded in reality. And F Troop was certainly cartoony. Cartoony enough to have a line of comic books even. So as a sitcom, F Troop was already pointed towards the exit. But having looked at it as a Western, how good was F Troop as a sitcom? Well, it's noticeably repetitive. Outside of the four main leads, the rest of the characters are literally one note. 
and that note is bad at their specific job. The bugler can't play anything but Yankee Doodle. The lookout has terrible eyesight. This guy is old. Rinse and repeat as needed. You can set your watch on some of these jokes. And a lot of this stuff is actually pretty derivative. F Troop bears quite the resemblance to another sitcom, The Phil Silver Show, probably better known by its informal name, Sergeant Bilko. This too was a sitcom about a small, insignificant, out of the way army posting, where a sergeant is constantly trying to pull off various get rich quick schemes behind his superior's back. F Troop is pretty much a Western reskin. And even the show's Native American tribe isn't entirely original. The Hekui are basically a PG version of an old Red Fox stand-up bit from the 50s. Many moons ago, tribe leave Massachusetts because pilgrims ruin neighborhood. <laughs> tribe travel west, over stream, over river, over mountain, over mountain, over river, over stream. Then come big day. Tribe fall over cliff. <laughs> That when a cow get name, medicine man say to my ancestor, I think we lost. Where the heck are we? Where the heck are we? You get us back home, you know we lost. And his buddy looked at him and he said, don't worry, Ugh, I know where we are. And his buddy looked at him and he said, well, where the fuck are we? Psst, hey, if you enjoy me talking about older television shows like this, I currently have a Patreon goal where, if I reach $1,000 a video, I'll start Nick Knacks at Night, a new series covering all the classic television shows that aired on Nick at Night. So if you really want to hear my thoughts on Get Smart or Car 54 Where Are You or SCTV, consider contributing to my Patreon. Yes, the jokes are repetitive and derivative, but the actors delivering those jokes are top notch. Larry Storch was an accomplished comedian and character actor who brought a lot of cowardly charm to Corporal Agarn, and the only award F Troop was ever nominated for was a primetime Emmy for Storch's performance. One trick the show kept pulling was having a distant cousin of Agarn show up, and having Storch play a dual role. You cannot make a fool of Diablo! The fiesta is over! Stand up against the war! The singing Marty! But he's my friend! I taught him to sing Frere Jacques. Lots of Russians are terrible. I'm terrible. I'm in the terrible. Storch really played well against Forrest Tucker, who had just wrapped up a long run as Howard Hill in the touring version of the Broadway musical The Music Man, meaning Tucker was basically a black belt already in playing charming con men. Well, I guess you'd have found out about it sooner or later. Find out about what? The widow. What widow? The widow Brown. Who's widow Brown? Well, she, uh, she owns this place. Has 16 children, no husband. He's dead. Yeah, that's why we call her the Widow Brown. Good thinking. But the real standout for me is Ken Barry as Captain Parmeter. Barry's chosen profession wasn't exactly acting, but rather dance, and he was good at it. His song and tap dance routines resulted in a lot of variety show appearances, and he even opened for Abbott and Costello for a time. Barry's physicality allowed for a level of physical comedy comparable to those of the silent comedians, with some really goofy and elaborate pratfalls. Pretty much every laugh I had watching F Troop came from Barry flipping about the place. I would choreograph stuff. I would find things in the set or outside or wherever uh, that I could use. It, it was usually indicated in the script when we went in to read for the first time in the week. Uh, it would, they got to a point where they wouldn't describe the business, the physical business or the prop or anything. It would just say business to be worked out with Ken on the set. And so I, I choreographed all those things. As for Melody Patterson, well, she's good in the role of Wrangler Jane, but there's a pretty big asterisk here. While some of the humor comes from how much more competent Wrangler Jane is compared to the rest of Fort Courage, the bulk of her stories revolve around her romantically pursuing the clueless Captain Parmeter. The problem was that Melody Patterson 
was a minor throughout the show's entire run. Patterson, whose biggest role at that point had been an uncredited unnamed teenager in the film Bye Bye Birdie, was 15 when she auditioned for the show, lying about her age until she got the part. I did well on the F Troop audition, and I knew it. So when the producers asked me, you're 18, right? I didn't argue with them. I said, right. I thought to myself, if I can just get tested, then I'll have some film. Then when they offered me the role, I thought, well, if I can just do the pilot, I'll still be ahead of the game. The show was well into production, and the first episodes were already airing before anyone realized the lie. One of Patterson's old onset tutors from Bye Bye Birdie had joined the production to assist a child actor, and she recognized Patterson and informed the producers. We were already a hit and it appeared on the cover of TV Guide. When it came up to a vote, I don't think ABC wanted to rock the boat, and I don't think it bothered Jack Warner too much. I was off for a week, and when I came back, I had a teacher. I don't know. Call me too modern, but I wouldn't continue to use an underage girl as the show's main love interest. Don't get me wrong, they weren't using Wrangler Jane for titillation. They weren't putting her in a bikini or anything. But she did spend a lot of time in the show smooching a man 16 years her senior. Oh, Wilton, you're so sweet. And so thoughtful. And so kind. Could you feel that? F Troop aired for two seasons, the first in black and white, the second in color, for a total of 65 episodes. The final episode airing on April 6th, 1967, 10 days before Melody Patterson's 18th birthday. While the show had some decent press coverage early on, it wasn't a huge ratings winner, never cracking the Nielsen Top 30. Not that it would have had a place in the lineup even if it was a smash hit. Westerns and gimmick-driven sitcoms were both on their way out. F Troop was a double whammy of dying pop culture trends, and it just wasn't that exceptional to begin with. The series entered syndication soon after. A replica of Fort Courage was built in the 1970s outside of Hoek, Arizona, a Route 66 tourist trap completely unauthorized by Warner Brothers. Quite the expensive undertaking for such a mid-level television show. The attraction is now long closed and abandoned, but the structure is still mostly there, if you happen to be driving by. While not directly related to F Troop, you wouldn't forgive me if I didn't mention this bit of trivia. Forrest Tucker and Larry Storch would find themselves paired together once again in 1975 for Filmation's The Ghostbusters, a children's show about paranormal detectives and one of them is a gorilla. As you can imagine, the 1984 film Ghostbusters resulted in some litigation, and this is the reason the animated show is called The Real Ghostbusters, but that's a whole other video. And so, we find ourselves back in 1991, and this here is my best theory as to why F Troop ended up on Nickelodeon. But I must stress, it's only a theory. I don't have any documentation to back this up. F Troop was produced by Warner Brothers, and they still own it to this day. Adventures of Superman, which we talked about last time, was produced by DC Comics. Through a series of mergers, Warner Brothers ended up owning DC Comics in 1969, and by extension, they owned Adventures of Superman, which they still own to this day. Both shows premiered on Nick at Night within a few weeks of each other. Both shows premiered on Daytime Nickelodeon on the same day, October 5th, 1991. Both shows aired on the same days of the week. Both shows left Daytime Nickelodeon on the same day, August 29th, 1992. And both shows left Nick at Night on the same day, September 3rd, 1995. It seems likely that both Adventures of Superman and F Troop were part of a combined syndication package, and it's possible that a channel might be contractually obligated to air both at the same time. Now, since Nickelodeon and Dick and Knight were, technically, two separate channels, if such a syndication contract existed, they couldn't get away with, say, airing Adventures of Superman during the day and only airing F Troop at night. I think it's very likely that Nickelodeon really wanted to use Superman's name brand recognition to attract a younger audience, and decided, okay, we can try to make F Troop work, I guess. 
To me, this is the most likely explanation, because I just can't imagine anyone in the Nickelodeon offices in 1991 thinking that this show was going to be a winner for them. It's the racism that really gets to me here. Nickelodeon had shown themselves far more sensitive to matters involving representation of indigenous people. Shows like Adventures in Rainbow County and Spirit Bay, which aired through special delivery, had very grounded and positive indigenous characters and stories. Hey Dude, a Nickelodeon original and the nearest thing to F Troop in content, went out of its way to challenge the pop culture image of the Indian. The channel wasn't afraid to remove Looney Tunes shorts if they were outdated and racially insensitive. This is the channel that aired Vegetable Soup for God's sake. Now Nickelodeon has made mistakes on this front, sure, but there's no way someone sat in a screening room for F Troop, saw all the red face and Indian jokes, and went, yep, that's acceptable. And even if this stuff wasn't in the show, I just cannot fathom the draw for children in the 1990s. It's just not that good. I don't know how well the show did on Nickelodeon, but anecdotally, most of the millennials I've talked to about F Troop didn't even know it from Nickelodeon, but rather a gag from Freakazoid. I, I wanted to do one of those funny things like, and you ever watch F Troop where Agarn says, there's no way I'm wearing a dress, absolutely not, no dress, and Forrest Tucker's like, yeah, you're wearing that dress, you're gonna wear that dress, and then they wipe, and Agarn's wearing a dress. <gasps> Yo! Look up, brothers! Look who's here! Oh, I love that bit. F Troop has never been hard to find. It had a substantial VHS release in the late 1990s, and the full series is available on DVD. At the time of this writing, you can find F Troop for digital purchase on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, and YouTube, but not on Max, despite Warner Brothers Discovery still owning it. But whether it's worth finding is another question. Even at its best moments, F Troop is derivative and dated. And even if it wasn't, it's still a very casually racist show. Some of that is the trappings of the genre, but mostly it's just bad taste in comedy. It really had no business being on Nickelodeon, and would be swiftly forgotten about as the channel grew into the 1990s. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time. We kick off 2024 with Nick Knack's episode 100 and the coolest girl of the 1990s. Today's research shout out goes to Riding the Video Range, The Rise and Fall of the Western on Television by Gary A. Yagi. There isn't a great deal of behind the scenes information on F Troop. I found my research sources a bit lacking this time, but thankfully this 1995 history of television westerns had a whole chapter on F Troop and really helped me see the show's place in the history of the genre. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other popular unit projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research materials, production values, and the occasional mozzarella stick. Remember, if you enjoy me talking about boomer-era television like this, I'll start doing Knickknacks at night if Patreon gets up to $1,000. You can also support the channel by liking the video, subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, leaving a comment, following me on social media, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. Thank you again for watching, and remember, Black Lives Matter.